As we stand here today, we may very well be on the eve of a Supreme Court decision that is no less monumental than Brown versus Board of Education or Loving versus Virginia. It is possible that this Supreme Court will deliver marriage equality to gay and lesbian couples in this country. It is hundreds of activists and some very brilliant uh, lawyers and strategists that have brought us to that place on marriage. But people don't understand that over the last couple of decades, it has not just been happenstance. There has been strategy in addition to the millions of acts of bravery every day by ever and ever younger LGBT people to speak the truth of their lives. There has been thought and strategy in how we got from there to here. And that's the journey I want to take you on today. So I want to take you back to the 1950s to make sense of how did we see such a monumental shift? How did we see the most compressed form of history and the most radical change in public attitudes of any social movement we've ever seen? In the 1950s, homosexuals were hated. We were seen as evil, perverted. We were serpents lying in wait trying to grab children and thrust them into sexual cults. And on our off hours, we were spreading communism as fast as we could around the globe. <laughs> I don't know why, but I know it's true. I sprang into this world as a little tiny lesbian. I just did. I knew it young. And while I was an American citizen, I was raised in Canada. I was born in 1956. And I never, I would not meet another gay person for years and years. But from that tiny place, I spent most of my youth running through the forests of Vancouver Island, often slaying dragons and saving maidens, because I didn't have any feminist analysis at that point. This is evidence that I continue to grow as a lesbian. And <laughs> My family, I sort of confounded them all the time. My family was unusual. I was the fourth of five kids. I had a World War II pilot father. I had a kind of colorful, intellectual Irish mother. Our house was full of chaos and was sometimes reckless. We were often short on cash and long on gin. But somehow, in the middle of all of that, my parents performed a miracle. They never shamed me for being a tomboy. They never shamed me for running home from school and as fast as I could, getting out of the little dresses and into my jeans. I could climb a Douglas fir faster than any kid in the neighborhood. And from the top, I would sway. And I would wonder, what is this difference? And what will it bring? I suspected it would be a great adventure. This is how I escaped from my little town in Canada. I was admitted at the age of 16 into the European cast of Up With People. And even while I saw myself as sort of a leftist feminist lesbian, that is how I ended up finishing high school. With a group of kids that were mostly draft dodgers and really talented musical kids from low income areas around the world and tons of homosexuals. That's where we found our way in 1974. I put myself through undergraduate school and then came to California, put myself through law school right in the heart of Silicon Valley because there was no place I wanted to work other than Apple Computer. I loved Apple Computer. And I loved Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs because they had a dream. Their dream at bottom was to take the power of computing, what we thought of in the 1950s as really the massive, huge Univac, and shrink it down and put that power right into the hands of the individual, thereby igniting innovation and creativity, wheels for the mind, so that every person could be their own Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo. And then a day came, and I really pondered and I looked out and around me and thought, 
my community, we are still besieged by AIDS and HIV. We need some sort of magic, the same sort of magic that Apple had created with great communications and really good weaving of messages and messengers. And in a way, different from a corporate brand, we need a social entrepreneurial approach to start to bring together not just the left of our country, but honestly, the grand swath of the middle of LGBT people and their parents. And so in 1995, I left Apple and I came to Washington DC to head up the human rights campaign. The first thing we did is we studied four organizations in depth, the American Red Cross, the Christian Coalition, the UJA, United Jewish Appeal, which is also now the Federation, and the AARP. And what we were looking for is what fundraising techniques work in the United States of America and what has worked for the last hundred years. And I said to the staff, I want this formula. Insurance is to the American Association of Retired Persons as X is to gay. What is X? What do we need to grow and attract and become a magnet for hundreds of thousands of people? It turned out the answer was the power of affinity. We launched what is now a ubiquitous third logo for the LGBT movement, a simple, crisp equality sign. It ended up proliferating everywhere, not just to the set of will and grace, but it could be spotted in China, Tibet, and all around the world. And it's like a secret wink that you are understood and you see each other. We knew that the rocket fuel of change was those individual gay people coming out every day in their truth. And we made sure that we were as wide and as broad as possible to catch all of them. We always had in our communications plan four filters. One, anything anyone said had to be affirming of the 13-year-old gay person. The second thing is we had to talk to the parents the mom in Iowa and the dad in Alabama had to understand what we were saying. The third rule was the most important. I had to be a nice lesbian on the air. So when I was going toe to toe with Jerry Falwell or Pat Robertson, the minute I became mean or shrill, we lost. And we needed diverse voices, tons of diversity to reach every corner of the country. In any movement on any cause, you have to be willing to leap over giants. It helped that I grew up in Canada. I had no mystical feelings about Congress. But when you can't get anything out of Congress, you have got to pivot and focus and deliver to the people you represent. And we did that. We started a program to leap directly into the everyday lives of LGBT people in the workplace, and we got hundreds of companies to voluntarily implement domestic partner coverage and all kinds of protections for their gay employees. It moved fast as a, as a slow moving grass fire. It didn't matter who was in the White House, it didn't matter who was in Congress. It moved cross industry, cross geography. We launched a family program to help gay people think about children and how to have them. You have to be very deliberate if you're gay and you want to have kids. It just doesn't happen in the back of a Volkswagen. So we spent years coordinating and putting out consistent messages and the right spokespeople over and over again. And in concert with the other amazing organizations out there, here's where we are today. Today, if you're gay, you get your own TV show. It just gets issued at birth. There is not a month that goes by that there's not another major sports figure that comes out. Entertainment, heterosexuals are desperately looking around the channels to find some heterosexually themed situation comedy. There's no more boy meets girl on the air. Uh, there's been an explosion in entertainment, which has frankly confused the American people because they think we have our rights. We are at a transgender watershed with brave people like Caitlyn Jenner facing down the most grueling, difficult truth.
that one could face. And then every once in a while, an amazing leader comes along. He passed the hate crimes bill, provided the leadership to change the policy, the horrible don't ask, don't tell policy in the US military and allowed open service for gay and lesbian people. And then he did an amazing thing. He took the Windsor case from last year, which struck down section three of the Defense of Marriage Act and the administration interpreted it to allow for all federal benefits. It was a watershed. It was a miracle. And so that, that brings us to marriage equality. We are literally on the eve of it. And I believe the court will finally rule that yes, gay and lesbian couples can indeed have the right to basic civil marriage licenses in every state in the union. There are two people that were phenomenal. One is Evan Wolfson, who was literally obsessed. He was obsessed years ago about marriage. And he was like our Paul Revere. He never gave up, he kept going. And then our Thurgood Marshall is Mary Bonato, a brilliant legal mind who step by step by step brought us to this place. But America loves to thump on its own chest and think we are incredible uh, as humans in terms of civil rights and human rights. But you know what? We're way behind all these nations. They did gay marriage years ago. And Ireland just did it by popular vote. We are so behind other nations, not just on this issue, but other issues that affect LGBT people. And when something's wrong, it's wrong for all time. It's just wrong. Plessy versus Ferguson was wrong in its time in the 19th century, late 19th century. Separate but equal was wrong. It was wrong then, it would be wrong today. If the Supreme Court is looking for more time for Americans to mull over marriage for gay people, it is not their job. Their job is to deliver justice, not to decide when justice should be delivered. So our work is not yet done. We still live in a country where there is still no federal protection, none, in terms of employment, housing, or public accommodation for gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender people. And this is a snapshot of the world. Everywhere that it's orange, red, or rust, you can be imprisoned or put to death for being gay or transgender. When Nelson Mandela had spent almost three decades in prison and then was released, and he was working and dreaming of the new South Africa, he spent weeks negotiating with the Afrikaners, and they covered every issue, truth and reconciliation, race, ethnicity, gender. They looked at every part of what that constitution should do, and they addressed every issue imaginable. And at the very end of the negotiations, Nelson Mandela said, there's one more thing I want. And the Afrikaners said, what are you talking about? What else could you want? And he said, I want to put sexual orientation and gender identity in the new constitution for South Africa. And they looked at him and said, are you out of your mind? Having spent so many years in prison and all those blood, the blood and the tears and the strife and the ripping apart of our nation, why would you insert such a controversial issue? Why would you do that? And Nelson Mandela said, having drawn a circle so large, I am not about to leave anybody out. And so today, South Africa is the only country on earth that has sexual orientation and gender identity embedded into its constitution. And from the time I was a little girl running through the forests on Vancouver Island and dreaming of a new world, I thought that was an idea worth spreading. Thank you. <laughs>